Thank you, Carol. Uh, let me tell you my testimony about what I feel God has done very specially for me here this week. Amongst many things, the teaching, the fellowship, um, is the, the fact that we sung a song which um, I love. I love very much Charles Wesley's song. You know that last tune, no condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him my living head and clothed with righteousness divine. And I remember we used to sing that song in Spring Harvest a few years back um, and reaching that climax um, uh, and, and, and claim the crown through Christ my own. Please be seated. I thought, sound quite right. So I got to say, hallelujah, praise the Lord this morning. And I was very, very pleased about that. The second blessing I think I've had uh, during this year in Spring Harvest is to hear white folks clapping properly. It's been... I just want to say, like Simeon, Lord, let your servant depart in peace. <laughs> but maybe not quite like that. You may have my problem, and my problem is this. I have a difficulty, it's supposed to be on this. Uh, I have a problem if uh, I start something which I can't finish. In my house, they have a bit of a difficulty with me. They uh, know that the food is being prepared or something uh, is waiting for me they check to see what I'm doing. Because there's nothing my wife hates more than for me to be stuck in something and refuse to come downstairs to join everybody else. That's simply because I have this fixation with finishing the things I've started. And so if you want to drive me nuts, start something which you don't quite finish. One of the strangest sights I ever did see, this microphone isn't working, is it? One of the funniest signs I ever did see we will experiment as we go along. <laughs> was, um, they're going to they're gonna switch me on. Let's see how this works. I will talk as he switches me on. I'm actually on, you know. I'm actually a switch. Isn't it wonderful to have all this attention? It's beautiful. Oh, goodness me. Oh, my battery's gone down. I'll tell you what. One of the funniest sights I ever did see, apart from this one, was, uh, I'm preaching still, see? Was being in South Africa. I think it was South Africa. I travel so much, you know, I get so confused. Um, and in the middle of a town, in the middle of a town, there was, hey, watch it, watch it, coffee. There was, there was, there was, there was a bridge. There was a bridge in the middle of town, beautiful bridge. Uh, problem with it, it kind of stopped halfway. <laughs> Just didn't take you anywhere. Uh, it appears that they didn't have enough dosh to finish the job. I am glad that the God we serve is just not like that. When God starts something, he finishes. And the God who began to create didn't stop, didn't rest, didn't take a coffee, tea break, extended lunch break until the sixth day when he had finished his creation and so to speak sat down and said, great stuff. Well, you know the feeling, don't you? That feeling you have when you finally convince yourself to go out to the garden and do the lawn. <laughs> when having convinced yourself, you look back on the grass you've just mowed and you say to yourself, yeah, that's good. Why? Because you finished. I wonder how many of you are going back from this place and uh, your ambition is to finish something. You're going to finish that PhD which has taken you the last 10 years. Or maybe you're just simply going to finish that piece of embroidery which you started last week or you started last year. And sometimes during the course of this week, in the middle of enduring faith and revealed faith and faith that saved, up came this image of that piece of work. I thought, my goodness, I've got to finish that on Tuesday or Wednesday, otherwise I am in trouble. Well, that's it. Faith, the faith of Christ, is a faith 
which doesn't satisfy itself and is not satisfied in us until that which God wants to complete in us is accomplished. And that's why Paul could say, He who began a good work in you is able to bring it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. And that's right, because Jesus himself was a finisher. Three and a half years of intensive ministry, healing the blind, raising up the dead, teaching good things, being a model for leadership. Three and a half years of intense ministry where he actually passed people who were sick, where he actually passed people who were blind, where there were some folks who never heard his voice, never heard him teach, but one day he arrived at the point of completion, stretched out on a cross, and he was able to cry out, it is finished. It finished. He may not have finished what everybody else wanted him to do, but he had finished what God gave him to do. And so Jesus reaches the point of completion in his own ministry where he can say with confidence, Father, the things I came to do and the most central task, I have done it. No wonder the writer to the Hebrews could describe him like that, that having done the work of purification, he sat down at the right hand of God. So God is interested in finishing what he starts. And we see in the model of our Lord Jesus Christ that he finishes what he begins. And let me tell you that the church which Jesus built on the truth of the revelation of himself is a work he will finish. How do you feel? Rather inadequate and incomplete in yourself? Well, if you're a part of the body of Jesus, if you're a part of the church Jesus died for, you need to know that 2,000 years of church history is really a story of God through Jesus finishing the work he began. Because when he said to Peter, on this rock I build my church and the gates of hell will never be able to oppose it, he intended for that church to be risen gloriously, complete without spot or wrinkle or blemish or any such thing, and he had you in mind incidentally. So Jesus will finish his work. Maybe that's the backdrop to the text we've just heard. Here is Paul looking back over years of ministry, looking towards the conclusion of his own life. He is in a situation which is probably not very comfortable. He is in a situation where he can look back and talk to a younger minister and encourage him in the faith. And Paul's concern is to make sure that this young man understands that God intends to finish and bring to completion what he has started in Timothy's life. I think it's an important passage for us to take away today. And we need to bear something in mind. The faith we have been teaching about this week doesn't stand up in abstract nothingness. Faith in itself doesn't save. Faith on its own is ineffective. Because faith was never meant in Scripture, and the Bible never uses faith, other than an instrument of God's activity in us and through us and to our world. This isn't abstract faith. But this is faith rooted and grounded in a number of things. First, it's rooted in the revealed character of God. It is faith rooted in the revelation of God's word to us. This is revealed faith in the person, the character, and the reliability of God and his word in Jesus. And so Paul comes into Timothy. He says to Timothy, there are a number of things I want you to be aware of. First of all, and let's pick him up here. Uh, I want you, he said... Uh, to realize that I am suffering. In fact, he said, the reason I'm suffering, verse 11, is because of the gospel. 
I want to give you a challenge that if you have the idea that leaving Spring Harvest and going back to your homes, back to the place you work, back to the place you study in, means that you have been really tooled up in faith, and therefore when you come back to town, the devil is going to run a million miles from you. You need to think again. If you think that as a result of being in Pete Meadows' seminar this week, that you are now going to just sweep through life and there will never ever be another problem, then you have made a mistake and you didn't listen to him properly, or at least you didn't listen to Sue and myself. <laughs> Suffering is a part of the package deal, my friends. And Paul sees no contradiction between the power of God he speaks about here in this chapter in verses 8 and 10. No contradiction about the resurrection ability of God, the potential for life, and the call to suffer. Our problem is that we are, I think to some extent, spoilt by the pampering of the instant gratification culture. Christians are in a culture shock when because of their faith, something happens which causes some kind of suffering. And you think suddenly, oh my goodness, I didn't know I was supposed to suffer, for heaven's sake. I thought this was resurrection time. What's suffering about? Oh yes, Paul says, I want to know him. I want to know the power of his resurrection. And I want to know what it means to be in fellowship with his suffering. If you ever have a chance to go to the States, one of the things which always fascinates me is their adverts. We have two things which they like to advertise more than anything else, it seems to me. Was that music in the background, or did I hear angels? <laughs> wow, that's... I thought it wasn't going to let me complete my sermon for a second there. <laughs> Love the adverts. The adverts pump out two things. One is, they, they give you a lot of uh, pill products to kill pain. And the other things they love to advertise is for lawyers, your attorney. Seems to me that the culture is, if something hurts inside, take a pill. If something hurts outside, get a lawyer. <laughs> and don't we have that kind of culture? Lord, I want to serve you, but my faith says nothing must hurt me. That's not the way it is. It's simply this, that sometimes because we are serving Jesus, Sometimes because we are faithful to him, we will suffer persecution. Those of us in our seminar once again learned that just this week. But faith which moves to completion is able to be the kind of faith which endures even in suffering. And so Paul is, has no embarrassment. He sees no contradictions here. And he talks about the fact that I am suffering as I am. And listen to this. Yet, I am not ashamed. How about that? What's going to be your testimony as you go back to your peculiar and particular situation today? Are you going to go back with a sense of boldness about what you've learned, about what God is doing on your behalf in Jesus? Will you be able to stand like Paul and say, being a Christian bears no embarrassment. Come on, people. It's time for evangelicals to take our eyes off the ground and stop stubbing our big toes in the dust and to look the opposition in the face and recognize that we have nothing to be ashamed of. Whether they find bones in a tomb or not, we have nothing to be ashamed of. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, said Paul, because it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and to everyone who believes. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. And that righteousness, said Paul, is by faith from first to last. Romans 1, 16 and 17. And so our faith tells us we don't need to be ashamed. Whether you're a Baptist or an Anglican or a Methodist or goodness me, even a ranting Pentecostal, you don't need to be ashamed. You don't need to be ashamed. 
We have a faith which has stood the test of time and will stand the test of time. A good friend of mine who I was with recently said, listen, when I saw the million march men of the Muslims in the States and heard Farrakhan and saw the way in which young men who are deluded by a lie will stand unashamedly, he said, it's time for me to get up and be in your face. <laughs> he said, it's time for some in your face Christianity. Yeah, that's right. You can be in the face of the opposition, not with arrogance, not with pride, not with superiority complexes, but in the fact that we have a God who has started something which he will finish. And so he said, I'm not ashamed. There's no embarrassment in being a Christian. I'm not embarrassed if I'm in the classroom situation. I'm not embarrassed because today I am unwell and I don't have all the answers to my Christian commitment. And people are asking me questions which I can't quite understand. I'm not embarrassed. I'm not embarrassed because I'm experiencing some note of persecution or misunderstanding. I'm not embarrassed because some people think that to believe in the death and the resurrection of a 33-year-old man 2,000 years ago doesn't make sense to them. I'm not embarrassed. And I'm not ashamed. Why? Because simply, I know in whom I have believed. Now, I really love this. I know. My old pastor used to say, used to say I know that I know that I know that I know. I'm not quite sure if I know exactly what it means, but it always sounds so <laughs> convincing. It sounds very convincing, but the third, no, I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. Um, but that's easy, isn't it? That's a bit trite. How can you know that you know that you know? But I don't, I'm... I'm I'm just not sure right now, Joel. I'm, right now, it's, it's, I've got just a couple of doubts, a couple of question marks. I don't know that there is any difficulty with doubting now and again. It may be quite a healthy thing, actually. Oz Goodness, Oz, uh, Oz Goodness wrote a book on doubt, didn't he? Descartes, the birth of modern rationalism, begins with this supposition of doubt. I am, therefore, I know I exist. Starts with doubt. Is there a problem with those times when you're not quite certain? God's faith in you is not limited to those periods, a week, a day, a month, half a year, when it seems as if the clouds have come over and I'm just not as certain as I was in spring harvest last year. God is not particularly thrown. God is not confused by moments of human uncertainties. God is not confused because today it seems I cannot say with the same assurance, Lord, you are faithful. There are times of doubt, and if you feel that way, you may actually be in good company. A man called Jeremiah, do you remember him? Who just wasn't sure sometimes whether God hadn't let him down and given him a rough deal. Another man called Job, do you remember him? Or could be job, depending on which Sunday school you went to. <laughs> or do you remember another man who had a powerful ministry? Three and a half years of all kinds of extraordinary miracles throughout Palestine. Sick people healed, dead raised, eyes opened. Uh, astounding teaching which confused professors. And then, and then one day he, he cries out, Eloi! Eloi! Lama sabachthani! My God! My God! Why have you forsaken me? It's Jesus, just for that moment. Lord, is it true? Is it real? But the faith of Jesus is stronger than doubt. Let me tell you, if you doubt for a moment or two, don't give up on yourself, because the faith of God which starts is able to bring it to conclusion. A man called Ron Mel I met for the first time two years ago. He struck me, a wonderful Bible teacher from the Four Square Church. He struck me because of his grace, because of his wisdom, because of his years of maturity. He struck me because here was a man who was talking as if every day was his last day on earth, and he treated it like that. Do you know why he did? He did that because he was suffering from an advanced case of leukemia. He behaved like that because he had suffered two major heart attacks, and quite frankly, at the time when I met him in the teaching situation, he wasn't too certain whether he would be around for too much longer. But there was something very striking about what Ron Mel had to say. He said this to us as he taught us, even if you doubt, start off with what you know. Even if you doubt, 
Start off with what you know. Do you know Jesus? You know, you may not have all the answers about Jesus. You may not even know exactly what he's up to in your life, but do you know him? Because that has to be the starting point. That was Paul's ambition again, wasn't it? That tremendous text in Philippians 3. Oh, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. He says, I don't want a righteousness which is of the law, but I want a righteousness which is of faith. And once we know Jesus in a personal relationship, and if David Beverton is to be believed, evangelicalism must be marked out as one of the distinguishing features by people who don't have only a mental ascent of who Jesus is, but a relationship with Jesus. Do you know him? Someone once said, a man or a woman with an experience is never at the mercy of someone else with an argument. Martin Eden is a colleague of mine in the Evangelical Alliance, and he and I were talking about two months ago. He was telling me about his conversion. I said, Martin, how did you come to know Jesus? He said, well, do you know, I was studying with a fellow. Um, we shared rooms in university, and he was a Christian, ardent Christian. Uh, I'm a rationalist. I love the arguments. And this man, I wiped the floor with him. Martin's given me permission because I thought it was such a wonderful testimony to use ourselves all over the place. He said, he said this gentleman uh, had a weaker intellectual capacity than mine. I could wipe him all over the floor. He wasn't really that clever a Christian. So when we got into talking about God, I could twist him all around my finger. But Martin said, do you know there was something about that man which really got to me? Because he knew God. He had something I knew I didn't have. Hear me. If you know Jesus, start there. Paul wants to know him. And the second thing you must know is that he is able. Why don't you say that with me? He is, shout it again. What then shall we say in response to all of this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies who is it that condemns? Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, 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 no. In all these, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor things present, nor things future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, he is able. For in him we are more than conquerors. Now what is a more than a conqueror? I was always quite confused about that. In fact, I was terribly confused. It seemed to me to make perfect sense that a conqueror was a conqueror, unless it was a conquer, and a, and a defeated was a defeated. And I was listening to a dear Methodist lady preach once. Howard, there is hope for Methodism. Where are you, my brother? The Lord is not here. I heard a Methodist lady preach. She was a wonderful woman, stood very, very... Uh, poised behind the lectern, didn't move, but made a lot of sense. And she said this, she said, a conqueror is someone who fights and wins. A more than a conqueror is someone who fights and cannot lose. He's able. 
And what he has begun, he will complete. Let me tell you two more things. Paul is saying, let's hang on to the teaching which we have received. Paul's words here are very important for us as we leave Spring Harvest, aren't they? God, what you have heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. In other words, if you know him and you know that he is able, keep what he has said. Someone said that the word shows us what to do and the word shows us what we should not do and the word tells us what to do when we didn't do what we should do. The word is comprehensive. Hold on to it. Because I have this feeling that if we hold on to the word, the word will, will hold on to us. Keep hold of the things you have heard, said Paul. But don't just do it in abstract. Do it in faith. Let faith grab hold of what God has said. And just don't do it out of a sense of loyalty, says Paul. Do it in faith and do it in love. Do it because you are passionate for it. Do it because you love Jesus. Do it because you love people. Because if you want to know the power of enduring faith, it is when we hold on to God, hold on to his word, hold on to it in faith and love that we find we have the power to complete what God has called us to. And finally, we do it, of course, by the power of his spirit. Will you stop trying to grin and bear it? Will you stop trying to muster it up and to wind it up? and to do it on your own. He has given us his spirit. And I don't mind which denominational brand you have or what kind of views you have about the work and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Apparently, not everybody speaks in tongues. I understand that there are some churches who don't do that kind of thing. I understand that problem. But whatever your view of the Holy Spirit is, he has come that we may not be alone. He has come to let us know that whoever you are, whatever you are, whatever you are doing, whatever God has given you to do, whatever God has started in you, he is able to bring it to completion. God bless you.